This is not a, this is not a, a, like the, the European the concepts of wealth work on the vertical. These guys up here have more stuff than these guys down here. You pinch it off and you try and accumulate as many horses as you can, right? The pinch off, where, where yep. uh, empathic, where an empathic connection doesn't flow downwards, but it does sort of trickle upwards. Oh, the bishop's daughter has a, has a blue, let's send her a pillow. You know? But the, you know, the starving guys, their kids are all dying. Somebody should do something about that, you know? And um, the, the climax sort of Mesoamerican economy works on the horizontal, where you got your three horses, John, so Johnny Three Horses gives his three horses away, one to the weird guy across the river that nobody likes, and then to this cat and this cat, and becomes Johnny No Horses, He's a much more important player than Johnny Hunter Horse. Johnny Hunter Horse is a stupid thing that, that they have done for the masses, the global masses, is they, they, the, the, the one percent, have forced us and inspired us to, to completely reinvent suffering. Reinvent suffering. Yeah. The, the, uh, the, the, the suffering that we the, the suffering that, that, that used to kind of exist in the you know in, in you know in the, the shadows of King Leopold's ghost the imperialist child massacres right um, but it, isn't suffering part of their, um, their it's part of their S and M script it's part of their well it's it's like part of their S and M script yeah. yeah. But so if we annihilate suffering, no, we're well, we not going to annihilate we suffering. Have to we're not no, it's, it's forcing us to reinvent and rediscover suffering, and and the the suffering of which has a lot of motivating properties. Yeah, so and at this stage, and at this suffering. stage, at this stage, we're moving to a, from a point where the suffering has gone from intense, like to like hyper intense, like to the rights of passage in the East and the East Islands have changed considerably because of that information. And the way information travels now, we don't now we don't send our sons to the island with the pigs to come back with you know uh, some money we, because they'll they'll come back with a Metallica T-shirt <laughs> and they'll be brainwashed and they'll never be they'll never they'll never work the the, the pig farm again. So you know it it it's it's a, uh, like right it like th this accelerated sped up alteration. Know, and the, the, I, I, I'm even proposing, I'm even a proposing a change in the laws of physics, is in the in the works right now because of the information technology. They're more, te they're they're now because of com algorithm-fed computer technologies in the in the business sector. They're more transactions in a minute. All right. So I'm going to read you something that I just wrote because I think I summed it up pretty well when I wrote it, so I'll kind of make sure that I get all the key points. Um, it's called The Beautification Dilemma. So here I am, sitting at the Venice Grind Cafe in California, contemplating the most complex of issues of my current reality. Los Angeles is known for its beautiful people, and that is exactly why I am visiting LA and Burning Man for the beautiful people and beings which includes the Earth. Over the last three years, 
maybe a little before my first Burning Man experience, or heck, probably um, even longer than that, I have been in and out of accepting and rejecting my female form. For a while, I stopped shaving my legs, but then I started again and loved the smooth feeling. Um, on the cusp of New Year's 2009-2008, I stopped painting my fingernails. So it's been a while, like three years. In high school, I refused to wear makeup, and now I am <laughs> I extravagantly paint my face whenever I go out. So last night, I went and bought some sparkly nail polish. And as I'm painting my nails, I, I was overwhelmed by my own self-image dogmas. Do I want to look like other females who do their nails? I got a hairdresser right before I came to LA to, uh, to clip in rainbow hair. I actually have rainbow hair. Kaylee Rainbow has rainbow hair. Um, and I haven't, haven't done anything to my hair other than trim it since grade 11, which is like 16. I'm turning 25 the day the man burns on Saturday. Um, like a week. Oh my god, I'm 25 in a week. Um, um, but, like, while I'm getting my hair done, I couldn't help but feel stuck within my own visual paradox. I think it all narrows down to my fear of other people placing me into some kind of intellectual category, or lack thereof, as if I would not be able to communicate on the highest level of consciousness had I not painted my nails, styled my hair, or spent any time on the way I look. I have this mantra for which I say when I have these self-beautifying doubts. When I look good, I feel good, and when I feel good, I look great. Uh, the YouTuber Ray of Thunder has an amazing video where she actually lectures herself on this subject. I don't remember what it's called, but I think that this video is going to be a response to her, her video. Um, all in all, I want to shout out to my, my fellow lady philosophers. Um, how do you deal with beautifying yourself? compared to retaliating against this media glam monster? How do you keep your intellect when you're applying your mascara or delicately color coordinating your clothes? That being said, I don't think I like sparkly nail polish. It's not working for me. But um, I, I, it would be absolutely stunning have uh, to receive any type of input on this subject because it's, I think it's a big issue, especially here um, in LA where I am right now, but um, yeah, I just, I really had a hard time last night painting my nails, it was like, oh my god, I went so long without it, and I'm like, why, why is this such a freaking big deal, um, and yet I, I, I keep thinking of, of all these like unfortunate, unfortunate, I don't know, people, or, or people that don't have this opportunity, but I do, I've been in an existence where I have this opportunity, so why don't I take it? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Alright, well. The sky is getting bluer and bluer, and, uh, yeah, I'm going to sip the rest of my cafe, and, uh, start contemplating my adventure up to the Nevada desert. Alright, well, uh, Peace out, cats and dogs. I'll see you soon. Alright, so that was my last shower before hitting the desert. So I enjoyed it as, as much as I possibly could. Alright, so first and last words combined. Well, you know, or Burning Man this year was really something else. <laughs>
Wow, I just, I don't know what to say. It was just, it was life transforming. I mean, I, I still feel the playa dust in every pore of my being. <laughs> I can feel the, the black rock wind blowing through my hair. Uh, the green, twirly, blobby things in the sky are still tracking our car all the way back from Black Rock. And the, uh, the dragon and the unicorn mobile ran out of um, orange crush fuel. <laughs> and... <laughs> right. We forgot to stock up. Yeah, okay. And, uh, let's see what else, um... How are the hot, hot hotties? The, tri the, tribal, hot, the tribal hotties were, uh, as hotty as ever. We're too cold this year. However, they're aging a little bit, which is a problem with their whole shtick, you know, is it's only good for a few years and every time, you know. After that, you know. And then, of course, the thing is they don't have a monopoly on feathers anymore, you know. It's like everybody at Burning Man is wearing feathers now, you know. Yeah. It used to be just the elite had the uh, appropriate feathery headdress and, you know, feathers delicately placed at just so point positions in their hair, you know, hair wrap and their do. But now feathers have become banal, commonplace, cliche. So what do you think next year's fashion at Burning Man will be? I think it will be, people will be doing neodymium snuffs. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> Which and goes straight to the brain. <laughs> and what is Burning Man? Burning Man is not an is. Burning Man simply does. But um, jump. For a long time. We're starting to change it. Well, for sure. I mean, the theme this year is rites of passage. And I mean, you know, you can go there and not think about it at all. When we start, like, we're, we're just uh, talking about having the lack of ceremony, even, in this current society. It dulls an experience. You end up not, you don't have an intention of something, like, you, yeah. I don't know, it's something I'm focusing on, basically. <laughs> yeah. Trying to... Okay. But, uh, well, you know, it's, yeah, so it's a weird thing. I mean, in, in some respects, part of it, you know, I mean, part of the... I mean, I've been part of the whole kind of rave dance thing going back to the beginning in the early 90s, and there's, you know, there's an element to it which is really just the same thing as the well, Western society as a whole. It's just sort of like losing, losing yourself and distraction. Then there's another impulse in it which is really, I think, authentically, we're looking to tap into something that, you know, the tribes people here had all going all the way back, you know. Yeah. And it has both elements, you know, and they're kind of come and go, and different people tap into them at different times, you know, and um, Burning Man also draws a lot of seekers there, you know, they're looking for something where not, none of us are really satisfied with what's out there, you know, um, yeah. so it's a weird, it's a funny, you know, amalgam, you know, and um, it's just sort of a community kind of grew around it, it was something kind of powerful, just powerful in the, in the image, and it means different things to different people, and I, you know, I think that's part of the power of Burning Man, that, it's, that, that they've resisted putting too much of a message on it, you know, they leave it kind of open to your interpretation, and then really, I mean, and this is what I always tell people that are new, like, it, it, it's really what you bring to it, it where it comes, what, what you put into it comes back to you, yeah. which is like life, obviously, but it's almost like a more concentrated version of that, you know. Oh, okay, so, she, she came all the way out here so to go nowhere. This is our last stop before Burning Man, we're picking up some water, and look what I find. It's only the best water on the playa.
Celebrated on a much even more intense level, you know, they had a more a deeper religious meeting, you know. So basically, Burning Man is not new. No. It's the, it's the specifics. It's, it's a it's a reformatting, you know. I guess you could say really ancient human traditions, which now you know, with the help of now we've got all of this crazy technology, you know, and all this, this you know, I mean. Burning Man is done on a shoestring in some senses, but we're all beneficiaries of this huge industrial culture that just pumps out stuff in every possible <laughs> form and variety and size and quantity. And we just, you know, all these people, this is like, you know, art, broke artists and some, you know, well-paid entrepreneurs and engineers and crazy motherfuckers. And there's uh, even oh, just one little cap. Everybody brings so much stuff. Liminality. <laughs> Liminality. Neither here nor there. <laughs> The ritual of crossing over, expanding at the border, on the verge, at the brink, on the cusp, putting it on the line, on the threshold of the gate amidst a revolving door, an entrance from which to look at the not yet future, a portal from which to view the fading past. Liminality, from the Latin word limen, meaning a threshold, a psychological, neurological, or a metaphysical subjective state, conscious or unconscious, of being on the threshold to a different thing. Yeah. Um, so basically, I, was, I had a plan to travel with my two cohorts, uh, Michael and Stephen. But in the airport, I ran into Rick Doblin, who runs the MAPS, Multidisciplinary Approach for Psychedelic Studies. Mm. And it turns out we were both censored by Burning Man this year. Because we were supposed to speak at TEDx, the TED conference they're doing. Um, but the Burning Man org wrote a uh, letter to the organizers and said, you can only do the TEDx thing here if you do not allow uh, Daniel Kinspeck and Rick Doblin what? to speak. Oh, what? this is juicy. <laughs> this is very juicy. Okay. <laughs> you got to You got to um, so, so we, we ended up, I w and jumped into his car, we were riding up together, we, but basically we lost my friends, we were ca caravanning with them, and, and my ticket was, and my suitcase was in their car, but essentially my mm. buddy's ticket was in their car. So, we, came, we got to the gate, and I didn't have a ticket, and so, you know, people sort of recognized me, so I was sort of playing off of that, I was trying to give Larry Harvey this book, with uh, this essay, that he has an essay that he wrote, and his book was published, so I kind of tried to use that to get in. <laughs> I reached Andy Grace, and she was going to send us an electronic ticket. Then their internet was down. So we were just in this holding pen for an <laughs> indeterminate period. Oh God! And um, what I recognized, well, I mean, I, you know, Rick really like was very impressive because his whole career is about 
kind of circumventing the law, like figuring out how to like undermine the <laughs> through the legal huh. blockages and so on. So as I was just kind of you know frustrated, he was very carefully scoping out the situation, like <laughs> asking people, well, if we get behind that, you know, into that area, would we still need to have a ticket stop, you know? <laughs> so so he worked it out and basically like <laughs> dust storm came out, I went and like <laughs> the truck, you know, got behind the flag, brought the car around. And uh, we made him drink at him. That's a rite of passage. You get shot of Ellis? This is our man, this is our little mascot, dude. This is his first time here at the other burn, so. <laughs> Ellis, how's his uh, burning going? Uh, his burning is awesome, actually, so far. He's taking a little, like, he's chilling out right now. Chilling? He's had a very uh, energetic morning. He's a little worn out. He's like, oh my god, hot. <laughs> That's We're good. bring him inside in a little bit. Yeah, right I think so. He's charging up. the desert. My third day in the desert to be specific. I don't think it could get any better. Are in the, uh, in the situation where we want to do something, you know, how can we do something to help the planet? And I would just encourage all of you to, to get yourself involved in mushroom cultivation, mushroom hunting, take your friends out, go out with your family and your children. You can't be poisoned from the most deadly poison of the mushroom by touching it. Nothing will happen to you because that's the most deadly poison mushroom in the world. But it's such a wonderful tradition that brings you back into, into nature. Like these mushrooms are like miniature pharmaceutical factories that have hundreds of thousands of compounds that are unique to them. And I think that by reinvesting in, in fungal wisdom, we have an enormous opportunity. And the last thing I want to say is that psilocybin mushrooms, I think, are medicinal mushrooms for the soul. I've said that for a long time. Right? These other mushrooms are medicinal mushrooms for the, for the body. But because we know that in emotionally depressed individuals, have immune systems that are depressed. And because that we know that that um, the placebo effect of believing in the power of a medicine can activate your immune system, it seems to me that the future of medicine as one potential area of exploration is to combine the power of the psilocybin mushroom experience with being able to activate an immune response to be able to make conventional medicines work better. So, just remember, I just visited Dr. Roland Griffith, my wife and I, at John Hopkins University uh, Medical School. Roland Griffith has now produced uh, four clinical studies on psilocybin mushrooms. I just heard that the FDA is considering removing psilocybin as a Schedule One drug to a Schedule Two drug. This is a pretty safe question to ask. How many people here have not tried psilocybin mushrooms? <laughs> wow. <laughs> so it's much safer to ask that question legally, but wow. Okay, so you are experienced. Okay, so um, the last so, thing, and then conclusions. Under supportive conditions, 20 and 30 milligrams per 70 kilograms of psilocybin occasions mystical-like experiences of having persisting causative effects on attitudes, mood, and behavior. Implications for therapeutic trials are discussed. Now, because we are emotion to influence our health, if you are better, better to relate to, to society, to your loved ones, to your neighbors, to people who disagree with you, you know, if that gives you a positive benefit, and as a society as a whole, 
that maybe truly psilocybin mushrooms are medicinal mushrooms for the soul. Thank you very much. Activations here. We got singing balls. We got Persian carpet out. It's really fancy for the desert here. Everybody playing. What, what is that music? I'm into. I'm. Hey, hey. I'm. I'm talking to the fans at all right now. Yeah. <laughs>
Oh, there's a big question mark. Come on, we're going around the inside. Okay. So I am donating, I am gifting my creative, I, I just really don't want to give this away, I really, really don't, and I want to give it to the temple as my gift, symbolize creativity and all of that, so uh, here it goes. <laughs> oh man, I'm on silent. Great break. <laughs> Thank you. Alright, no problem. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Huh? Do you want me in the picture? Oh, no.
much. Um, that last piece was called Inspiration and uh, this whole experience of being here and stringing the temple and sharing it with you is an incredible inspiration. So I dedicate that song to you.